Hoy Marlene, ¿cómo va? ¿Todo bien? Puedes escucharnos. Está bueno. La gente comienza a hablar en inglés. Yo pienso que podemos comenzar. Sí. Está bueno. Welcome everyone for this Friday Academy section with the Pacific Neurological Institute. It's a honor to introduce Dr. Clarice Salim Yasuda, Assistant Professor and Neurosurgeon of Neurology and Neuroimaging Laboratory in the Unicamp, Brazil. Uh, Dr. Clarissa is graduate, was, is graduate in medicine at the State University of Unicamp, 1998, residence in neurosurgery, uh, 2003, master degree, 2005, doctorate, 2009, in medical science neurology at the State University of Campinas. He completed postdoctorate at the University of Campinas on he all, uh, she also held a postdoctorate at the University College of London, 2011, UCL, in functional resonance and epilepsy, as well as the University of Nottingham, 2012, with, emphas with emphasis on high file functional resonance, seven Tesla. She did postdoctoral studies at the University of Alberta, 2012 to 2014, doing part of, the, of his time with research in neuroimaging and part as an epilepsy surgery fellowship. She is currently a professor, a assistant professor in the Department of Neurology at the UNICAM. He has experience in the field of medicine with an emphasis on epilepsy and neuroimaging acting mainly on the following themes, epilepsy surgery, partial epilepsy, magnetic resonance, and other MRI analysis techniques. It's a honor to uh, have you here, Professor Clarissa. Thank you for your kind words. Uh, it's an honor for me uh, to participate in this series of webinars. I'm very happy. Thank you, Carlos, for the invitation. So Carlos asked me to talk about the functional imaging from the basic principles and the applications uh, to clinical scenarios. Are you listening to me? Is this okay? Is Perfect. It fine? Fine. Okay. So, so this is my agenda. I will talk about functional MRI. I will start with basic principles today and talk about board and task related. Because we have short time, I will not enter into resting state studies today. And then I will talk about the clinical application going up, uh, through surgery, epilepsy, using the language and motor fMRI, okay? So you can interrupt me anytime you want. If you have any questions, I can try to answer, okay? So I am a doctor and I am not a physicist, so I may not be able to answer all the technical questions. So I beg your pardon for that, so. So talking about fMRI studies, what is fMRI? So fMRI and uh, the method use currently standard MRI scanning hardware to detect changes in the regional blood flow and metabolism that are associated with regional brain activation. So it's a nice method to try to investigate uh, areas of activation uh, without invasive techniques. So that's why it's became so popular. Uh, how do we do that? So fMRI measures signal changes that correlate with neuronal activity. So that makes it very interesting. Uh, how does it work? So it measures changes in the blood oxygenation indirectly, not directly. It is nice because it's non-invasive and non-ionizing. It can be repeated many times. So uh, you can use many times for the same subject and can be used for a wide range of subjects for large groups. Uh, another aspect that is very interesting for fMRI is because it combines a good spatial and also reasonable temporal resolution. So I like to use this imaging 
to help people to differentiate what type of image we are talking about. So most of the clinicians uh, are used to see the structural MRI. What is the difference? So here it is very, very blurry if we take a look. What happens? So this image here, it usually takes uh, about six to five minutes to acquire the entire image of one image of the brain. Here it's the opposite. The whole brain is scanned in two seconds. So here I have a very high spatial resolution and here I have temporal resolution, okay? So from now on, we will be talking about this type of images. And remember, everything will be about the voxel, the, the unit. So in fMRI, we scan uh, the whole brain several uh, times during a certain period, amount of time. And then uh, like here, we are looking uh, at the voxel, right? And the intensity of the signal in each voxel. What is the signal we are measuring? Well, we will be talking about the bold signal. So we will be talking about bold signal fluctuation. So here we have like the whole time and then we will uh, investigate what is happening with this bold signal over time in each voxel, okay? So what is bold? I don't know if uh, all of you are aware of this. So we have, uh, the brain is in the normal status. And when we um, demand a task or activate a region of the, the brain, what happens? There is an influx of oxygenated blood, right? Because there is the demand of uh, more oxygen to the region. And then it happens that we have the blood oxygenation level dependent contrast. How does it work? So I'll try to explain this in a simpler way. So it's important to know that the oxyhemoglobin, it is, has characteristically is, is, a, is a diamagnetic, okay? But the oxyhemoglobin, it's a natural contrast and it is paramagnetic. So it, uh, here we can see all the, the spins are aligned here. What happens in the brain when you ask a region to be activated? So with a stimulus, the brain regions involved with the task become oxygen rich and then decreases the level of the, the oxyhemoglobin. So the drop of the paramagnetic, uh, the oxyhemoglobin is that they generate the bold contrast. That's why we say it's an indirect uh, measurement, okay? Not a direct measurement of the changes in the oxygen. So the bold, we see it indirect effects are associated with the neuroactivity. It's a hemodynamic response from the vascular system. So here we see, so when we change uh, the status from uh, deactivated to uh, activated status, we need this, the oxygen enters the, the region, there is a difference in the signal and that difference can be captured by the MRI. Okay, so that's, the result of this is the fMRI that we can use for investigating different uh, areas in the brain. So given the basic principle, so if you have any question, I can try to go back. What do uh, you think? Everything's okay. I, I think so that we can, uh, we can make the question at the end. Okay. So, so after talking about the basic principles, I will enter the time. Now I will talk about the task related uh, fMRI, okay? So uh, task related fMRI. So there are many examples for the use for neurologists and also for psychiatry and other type of studies. Okay, so this is a nice reference for those interested to see what type uh, of studies we can use using functional uh, imaging in neurology, okay? So I, I brought this picture to illustrate it. How does it work? So I, maybe not all of you are used to fMRI. Uh, so how does it work? So we lay down the patient uh, on the, in the scanner 
and the patient will receive a, a certain type of uh, stimuli. It can either be uh, delivered by the visual monitor, like here. So this big uh, device here is built to, there's a, a set of lens here. So the subject will see here, there's a, a small screen in, we, in which he can uh, see some images. Or he can use a compatible headphone. So we can deliver the stimuli using this uh, type of devices, okay? So when we talk about task-related fMRI, we have basically two types of paradigms, okay? So in A, we see that uh, this is the most popular paradigm that we call, this is named block design, because we have blocks of stimulus alternating with rest, okay? And we are acquiring the imagings of the brains nonstop like here. And here we can see what happens with the bold signal. We see that the bold signal, it raises um, along with the stimulus, okay? So every time you have a stimulus, we have the elevation here of the bold signal. When you have the rest, it goes down again. So this is the most popular, most straightforward uh, type of paradigm used in task related. However, we also have a second type of paradigm that is named event related paradigm. What is the difference? As you can see here, this is predictable. So you have uh, like 20 seconds, 20 seconds, 20 seconds, and then so on and so forth. But here, the important aspect of this type of paradigm is the surprise element. The subject is inside the scanner, but he cannot uh, predict what time the stimuli uh, will appear to him. So this uh, element of surprise has a certain type of uh, impact in the brain. And for some type of stimulus, it, it is supposed to be to elicit a stronger uh, bold signal compared to this. So some uh, memory paradigms, or some language, more specific paradigms are better uh, accomplished with uh, this type of uh, paradigm but sometimes we prefer to use the block design for more simple tasks like motor, visual, okay, auditory, we use block design. But we, it's nice to know that we have these two types of uh, design uh, to program the paradigms for the scanner, okay? So I, here is one very simple type of uh, block design paradigm. So the stimulus here is uh, to alternate periods of eyes open and closed, you see? So when the eyes are open, we are stimulating the occipital region. When it's closed, the signal goes down. Can you see it here? So, but how can we um, obtain this activation? We need to mathematically um, subtract the baseline here related to the rest periods of or the closed eyes from the periods in which we have the stimuli, like the open eyes in this type of task, okay? How do we do that? There are many softwares available for fMRI processing, and most of them are free. And here at the Unicamp, we use uh, one of uh, very famous software that we, I learned at the UCL that's named SPM. SPM states for statistical parametric mapping, okay? And it runs in the MATLAB platform. You can use Linux, you can use Mac, or you can use Windows to run. But to use SPM, you also need a, a MATLAB uh, license uh, along the way, okay? In addition to that, we have a, a very nice uh, research scientist with us that uh, his name is Bruno, and he developed uh, additional software that we call UF2C using SPM. So this makes our lives uh, much easier. So if you are interested, you can uh, take a look at this, or we can also give his contact if someone is very interested in the methods uh, of fMRI. So here I have one uh, example for you to understand how is it possible for us to find in the brain that specific region of the brain that became activated when you deliver the stimuli. 
So imagine you get, uh, you have um, a motor uh, task, like with rest and task alternating like here, and you extract a voxel, uh, the signal from the voxel in the motor region. So you can see that the signal is fluctuating more or less according to this fluctuation here, okay? So we say that the signal in this region is highly correlated with the task. However, if we take the signal from uh, the occipital lobe, for instance, or parietal lobe, we see that the both signal fluctuates in a random way. It is not uh, correlated with uh, the paradigm we deliver to the subject. So we say that this region is very low correlated with the task. So using this information is uh, how we can um, detect the activation in the brain, okay? Again, so there are several softwares. So you have uh, SPM from UCL. You also have FSL from Oxford Group. You have Affini from the US uh, and groups and others. So here is the software we use that we need uh, to run with the MATLAB platform. So how complicated is it to get the signal processes? So fMRI, uh, requires uh, several steps. And I think it's not the topic of the presentation today, but I will just uh, show we need to do a lot of mathematics to obtain the, the activation map, okay? So just basically we have, uh, we usually, usually divide the process in two levels. So in the first level, we will get the individual activation map. Okay, so we have one subject, he goes to the, we put him to the machine and then we will obtain the activation map for a language or motor paradigm, okay? So when we use this, so we use this, for example, for surgical planning. So it's, we are only interested in the activation map for that uh, specific subject. But if you are interested in research, uh, we can go to the second level in which we are able to perform group analysis. So fMRI has been widely used in thousands of uh, studies in neuropsychiatry, psychology, and many other uh, areas. And with group uh, analysis, we can also use that. So how do we do that? So we will combine the maps from a group of patients and then a group of uh, control, for instance, and then we can perform statistical analysis. And in the end, we can get the difference. So we can see what is more or less activated in the group of patient compared to a group of controls. Okay, so this is just an example of uh, another use of um, fMRI. So now I will enter the second part of this presentation and talk about the clinical application. So the first and uh, most popular use of uh, fMRI is related to surgical planning, okay? So, so this is another study that is also very interesting that shows many clinical application and now some future directions uh, of fMRI if you are interested. So Carlos, I. When I spoke to Carlos, uh, he said it would be nice uh, if we could uh, brought some uh, real cases, okay? So that's why what I try to bring to illustrate the use of fMRI. So imagine you have a patient who comes to you and with a motor seizure. So it's an adult. And then when you perform the investigation, you identify a tumor like this. And she has a... Uh, this patient is a female and she has a motor seizure. So then you are interested to know where is the uh, motor activation in this case, because we need to operate this patient. So we performed motor fMRI for this patient. So as I mentioned previously, we use it a block design paradigm, which is very robust with a visual stimuli. So the patient was instructed 
with visual stimuli to alternate hand tapping for 20 seconds with 20 seconds of rest. And this was repeated five times, okay? In the end, we were able to obtain the activation map. And here we use it to see the relationship between the activation map with the lesion. And uh, it's nice to say so. Then it helps the surgeon to plan the approach and, and also for us to plan the monitoring state when we want to stimulate in, um, during the surgery, okay? So the patient was operated. She is now seizure free under medication and she has no motor deficit. Okay, it was a very nice uh, case. You can also have visual fMRI. So this type of stimulus is very, very strong to the brain. Okay, so if you, for instance, have a dysplasia, a tumor, or any type of lesion in the visual area, you want to see the relationship between the activation uh, area and your lesion, you can uh, perform a visual fMRI with a block design paradigm. You use this type of uh, stimulus, okay? And it's, so motor paradigms and visual paradigms are very robust and very strong. So these are very reliable paradigms to obtain the activation regions of each of these stimuli. Okay, so this is one of the example we have from our center. Okay, so I think most of you are interested in what are the roles of fMRI in epilepsy. Okay, and we can see there are many. So what, how can we use uh, fMRI? So fMRI can help us to determine the lateralization of language dominance and also to predict the risk for language uh, decline after surgery. So there are some studies in recent uh, studies that have proved that. It can also be an adjunct to direct cortical stimulation for mapping the relationship of lesion to language, motor, and somatosensory areas, as uh, I showed that. It can also be used to predict memory deficit following temporal lobectomy. And there is this uh, last uh, example. So you can acquire fMRI or EG fMRI, which can also help you to localize lesions when sometimes the EG and imaging are discordant, okay? Uh, because we don't have uh, much time, so I brought, um, a real case from our center that uh, we studied uh, last year, okay, using uh, fMRI and other modalities. Okay, so here is our patient. So it's a male, so the guy is 26 years old, he's right-handed. He had seizures starting at the seven years. Uh, so when we evaluated him at the beginning of 2019, he had uh, daily seizures. What type of seizures? So he had two types of seizures. The first one, um, he had a staring, impaired awareness, right arm uh, became dystonic, and then he evolved to bilateral tonic colonic seizures. But he also had another type of seizures, which started uh, with aphasia, uh, had some chronic facial movements, and uh, associated with impaired awareness. So because uh, it was a pharmacoresistant epilepsy, we included the patient in our investigation, trying to uh, investigate if it would be possible to offer a surgical treatment uh, for the patient. So the EEGs, most of them showed epileptic form activity in the left frontal lobe. We also perform a video EG, which uh, we were able to record two seizures in the left frontal lobe. Uh, with fast spread and uh, generalization. Uh, the MRI, so how do we perform MR, uh, MRI here? When we are uh, talking about uh, extratemporal epilepsy, and then we have a suspicion of a focal cortical, cortical, cortical dysplasia, sorry. We have an additional protocol 
a more sophisticated protocol, which is was designed to investigate focal cortical dysplasia. Okay, so the clinical um, features and the EG uh, pointed to the left uh, frontal lobe. Okay, and so this is one of the images. If you can see here, we can see um, some uh, hints that uh, like we have a, a more uh, different sulcus here from the superior frontal gyrus. And when we look at here, it's became uh, more clear. We have this blurring here. We have this sulcus that is different from the other sides. We have this small dimple here as well. So this area became very suspicious for Professor Sands. And so this is another sequence that we have, very specific, that also help us to see the blurring here, okay? Uh, so the patient also uh, underwent neuropsych psychological evaluation. So memory was normal, visual naming was preserved, but the verbal fluence was abnormal. So putting all together, so we had a suspicious lesion in the left frontal lobe. The semiology sometimes suggested also language problems. We decided to perform fMRI for this as additional, as part of uh, our investigation. Okay. So we performed a motor fMRI and then uh, we obtained a very typical activation of the left percentile and the right cerebellar regions. Okay. Uh, the, the lesion for us was not uh, very close because we believed it would be more in the front. Okay. Like we hear, so we have the typical activation. And we also performed a language fMRI. So because we have a visual stimuli, you see how strong is the activation in the posterior regions. But we see here that we have more left than right activation um, in the frontal lobe, more in the basal region, okay? So it's also for us, it's when we count the cluster, we see that is also a more typical activation with more clusters in the left frontal lobe, okay? Like here. So one can ask, oh, did you perform a patch? Yes, but because patient had so many uh, activity in the EG, the patch was not very helpful for us. It also showed some uh, alterations in the left hemisphere, but it was not very localizatory as we could expect, okay? So then with all the exams put together, we performed a surgery with electrocorticography. And you can see here the resection. And uh, fortunately, the patient is now free of seizures. So one can ask, so did you find any type of cort focal cortical dysplasia? No, we didn't find any specific only um, mild alterations in the uh, white matter, but not uh, a definitive, uh, we could not classify uh, in one of those uh, displays. Okay, but the patient is, uh, is very, doing very well. So just to illustrate, I brought some, uh, another example. So this is uh, fMRI, language fMRI performed in a subject. This patient has not been operated yet. So the patient had a suspicious lesion in the left temporal lobe. And then we were, we wanted to know whether or not he had a typical or atypical language activation. And here we show an atypical map which, in which we have bilateral activation. Okay, very different from the other one. Uh, so this uh, here we have only another example of uh, motor fMRI when you are investigating a patient with uh, FCG in the motor area. You can use uh, motor fMRI and see the relationship between your activation and the region that you suspect. 
So uh, I know it's, uh, I have already completed my 30 minutes. I just want to show some uh, more examples of how language fMRI can be used in, in epilepsy. So I will take only a few minutes. So this is a recent uh, paper that shows that fMRI can also predict uh, naming changing after adult temporal lobe epilepsy surgery. So the type and the location and the intensity of activation can help you to predict the deficits uh, after surgery. So this is an uh, example okay, of uh, language fMRI studies that help you to predict uh, surgical outcome. Um, so what else can we do with fMRI? So fMRI can also be used to study the effects of some drugs. So this is a, a study uh, that I performed uh, when I was, uh, well, my name is, is missing here. So when I was um, in UK, we used fMRI to investigate the um, no, so not this one. I will show the other. So this is my study. Sorry. So the effect of the pyramid on cognitive fMRI. Okay. So I think uh, you are clinicians, and so you know that the pyramid is well known to cause language deficits, most specifically word finding difficulties, right? And then we were interested to see what happens in the brain, what the, what the pyramid uh, causes in the brain. So. We had uh, several patients that performed a language fMRI, and then we divided uh, uh, in the group. So we had the controls. So these are the patients that uh, were taking different drugs, but not to paramate. They were all with epilepsy. And then these are the patients that were taking to paramate. If you see here, it's very clear that the intensity of uh, language activation, here are the normal in the controls, here are patients taking different drugs, and here are patients taking topiramate. So we have a very small uh, cluster of activation here. But the most striking finding is related to the deactivation. So in order uh, for the subject to engage properly in a task, the subject has to deactivate a network, okay? So you deactivate this network, which is in blue because it is negative, and then you are able to activate the other one. What happens uh, in epilepsy? In epilepsy, you have a problem to deactivate this network. So if you do not deactivate this properly, you are not able to activate the other. Okay. And if you are taking topiramate, so this is a huge problem. The ability to deactivate this network is really uh, disturbed. So you do not deactivate here, and then you do not engage in the task. So we believe this is one of the reasons that a patient has so many difficulties in finding the words. Okay, so what type of task here? So this was FAS task. So the subject was inside the scanner and he was instructed to produce uh, words beginning with uh, a certain letter. Okay, so it's a, also a very strong paradigm for normal people, but when you are taking the drug, you see that there's a very um, a small activation uh, related to, to the drug. So just, uh, I follow up this study and here uh, in Campinas, and then we included the patients not uh, without epilepsy. So I wanted to see the effect of the paramate, excluding the effect of uh, epilepsy. So I had uh, headache patients. So there were some students uh, or the doctors so this is out of scanner measurements. Here is the FAS, so this is variable fluence. So these are normal controls. So if you are uh, taking topiramide, you see there's a significant reduce of uh, your variable fluence. And if you are taking topiramide and you have epilepsy, it is even worse, okay? And how is the brain? Again, so, it is a normal controls with the normal uh, left side activation. So these are TLE patients taking topiramate. It's nice to see they have bilateral activation. And if you are only have headache and taking topiramate, you have a very poor pattern of um, language activation. 
And what happens with the deactivations? Here we see, so in the controls, you have normal deactivations, but you don't see this in TLE patients or headache patients taking toparamine. So this is in preparation. We hope to publish this uh, soon. Okay. So I think um, I extended uh, my 30 minutes and I want to thank you for your attention. So this is Unicamp and we are now having Carlos and Marlene with us. Unfortunately, we are facing the, the COVID and hopefully we will have uh, back to the most soon. Okay, and this is our group. So then here we have uh, Dr. Fernando is the leader of our group. So thank you for your attention and uh, I'm here open to the questions if, uh, if you have some. Oh, very pleased with a uh, great lecture, Dr. Clarissa. Everybody here is really a pleasure with that one. Uh, there are some questions about uh, the conference, but uh, I don't know if anybody here in the Zoom chat wants to uh, ask something. If you want, can activate the microphone and ask it. I don't know. Okay. I'm gonna make the first question, uh, Dr. Clarissa here. Uh, one of our assistant uh, asking, uh, are there any are there any clinical condition that could limit the proper acquisition of the fMRI? Yes. Okay. So one uh, one of the most important requirements to perform a good fMRI acquisition is the ability to become still. So so this so this is very difficult to perform fMRI for children and for patients that uh, are very confused or unable to become very quiet. So. This is an uh, important uh, restriction. And is, uh, anybody has um, involved the cognition or retardation uh, development? It's also a trouble for acquisition of, MR of fMRI. Yes. So even if when we think about epilepsy, so for here, for instance, uh, there was a PhD student who was studying uh, language. And she was interested in very specific aspects of language. She was a, she's a psych psychologist. Um, and then what happened? If you design a very complicated paradigm, the subject is not able to engage because he does not understand the, the guidelines, the orientation. So he will not engage in the task. So it is useless. So sometimes you have to adjust your paradigm, the complexity of your paradigm to the level of intelligence and comprehension of your uh, group of study. Yes, so it is uh, absolutely important to adjust the level of difficulty to the type of subjects you are dealing with. That's great. Another one here is, what is the, what is the sensibility and specificity correlation that it could have with the BADA test? regarding language lateralization? Well, I cannot give you the exact number, but uh, I can search. For, there are some studies that compared it. It's a good, uh, it has been uh, more and more used uh, in replacement of the VADA test. But I do know by heart uh, the exact number I can search for, but there are some studies that compared uh, this to the two for the same subject. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have the, the number by heart. That's great. Uh, many people here are asking uh, if you in Unicamp uh, already already do the VADA test or is also, no. also it? No, we do not perform a VADA test here, no. Perfectly. And the last one here is, what is the possibility of false positive in the language lateralization versus motor component compromise. There is some difference for false positive. Um, 
when you use a very simple paradigm for language activation, so I also do not know about numbers like this. What we know is that for motor paradigm, it is very robust. So the chance of you having a false, I don't know exactly what the sub, the, someone can uh, mean, like false positive, like mean, uh, okay, so maybe false positive, you say activation in a place where it does not exist, is it? Um, okay, so there are some uh, properties or some uh, adjustment that you make when you are analyzing the images. So the threshold in which you consider uh, a true activation, so you it, it can also impact, yes. So and um, you have to be sure you use a high threshold to only consider the uh, really activated uh, voxels as part of the, your map yeah so and for that that's how you need to do this uh, a lot of mathematics and uh, use uh, very high thresholds to avoid uh, false positives yes yeah, so this is a matter of statistics uh, in the analysis yes but uh, for for this type of uh, basic paradigms for motor mainly, it is uh, the paradigm is so robust that uh, even if you use a very high threshold, you are certainly obtaining the correct activation. When you go to a very complex paradigm, then it is uh, become more complex, okay, and more risky to talk about uh, this uh, activation. So I know it is uh, when you are talking about surgical planning or epilepsy studies, so you want to be sure you are not dealing with false positives. So this is a matter of using the right paradigm to be sure the subject engaged in the task. So there are some uh, methodological measurement that uh, you have to be sure the patient really engaged in the task. So this is basic. So if you are not sure the patient engaged in the task, you can either have a false negative as well. So you don't find the activation, but because the patient did not perform the task correctly, okay? so. These are all methodological issues that are very important when you are working with fMRI. It's a mathematics and models. As well, yes. Okay. It was a, a really great uh, conference, uh, Dr. Clarissa. Uh, I don't know if anybody here wants to do any more questions. Do you have any time? I think so that there are in, there are more people with question or there okay. are uh, uh, or there are so more so much more doubts <laughs> or <laughs> it's already you know, it's already understood if they want to I, I can i can answer some more but if they want to send me email um you can uh give them my my email i'll be i'll be happy to help and I want uh, South America to be performing more and more fMRI as well. So here we have uh, some courses as well. So please, you but can bring your questions and uh, we'll it, be it, happy it, to help. It could be great, Dr. Clarissa, because there are so, so many people here in our group that have a lot of uh, questions uh, in, daily, in daily work and much more with the uh, epilepsy patients that, that has a lot of thin, uh, a lot of things daily in the semiological and the semiological clinic also. Um, but finally, fMRI uh, being widely applied to a student in physiologic and pathophysiologic disease of the brain, the, I think so that there are so much more things that uh the, the our group wants to wants to know in our words yeah so, so you can send me the questions yeah so this is the i only today i only spoke about the task related the fmri so the other word a different word is like resting state fmri which i didn't mention 
because it would be much more confusing and much more complicated to go through. But uh, I think we always start with task related fMRI because it is more uh, straightforward and uh, easy to understand and it is more tangible for uh, people. And, but anyway, so you send me the questions and I will try to answer by mail, okay? Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the break. And it was a, a really honor to have you here with our group in this Friday academic, academic uh, session for the Pacific Neurology. I, I thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to be part of this. Have a good one and yes. enjoy the weekend. You too. So have a good weekend. Uh, stay safe, everyone. Yeah. For all of you, thank you for uh, uh, sharing this time with all of us uh, of the Pacific Neurological Institute. And we see you soon at the next Friday at five o'clock uh, the Colombian time. See you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.